TJ, can you hear me? This is Len. Can you hear me? Yeah, Len, yeah, Len we, we can, can hear, you. hear you. Okay, I'm going to put mine back on mute. Okay, I can hear you, Randy. Thank you. I'm going to be back on mute. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Bellflower City Council. It is Monday, July 13, 2020. It is 7.03. By my watch, we are reconvening from open session. Uh, there is no reportable action uh, that was taken during the closed session. And again, it's 7.03 by my watch, and I'm calling this meeting to order. Before we begin, please note that all public meetings will be recorded. When a participant logs in via their computer or calls in to join the meeting, their name and or phone number will be visible to all participants. Unless you are providing public comment, your audio will be muted and your video will be disabled. Persons wishing to be audience members to the meeting may do so anonymously. Anon anonymous participants, however, will not be recognized for public comment. Persons who seek to bypass the city's host controls will be dropped and blocked from the meeting. Thank you for your cooperation. Madam City Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Dutton. Here. Councilmember Hamada. Mm -hmm. Here. Councilmember Santanez. Here. Mayor Potem Coops. Here. Mayor Garza. Here. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Uh, for item number seven, our invocation tonight will be led by Mayor Potem Dan Coops, and our Pledge of Allegiance will be led by my colleague, Councilmember Ray Dutton. Would you uh, please stand, please? Please bow with me for a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening hour to give you praise and thanks. We thank you for our city. We thank you for our inhabitants. And we thank you for our city staff, our churches, and our service clubs, which all serve together to make Belfar a great place to live. We ask for a special blessing on this, as, as we know those that are suffering with the coronavirus. We are mindful of two of our past mayors, Clyde Wilson and Randy Bumgars, who have been fighting the virus for the last week. Please be with us as we think of our doctors and all the health care providers and keep them safe. Be with our first responders, our firefighters, and our sheriffs as they serve to protect all of us and uh, give us the guidance that we need as we consider the meeting tonight. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you for that, Mayor Pro Tem Coops and Councilmember Dutton. Item number nine, City Council announcements. I'm up first. Uh, discover your COVID-19 antibody status. For a limited time, the American Red Cross will test all blood, platelet, and plasma donations for COVID-19 antibodies as an additional health service to their donors. This testing may provide critical insight into whether donors may have possibly been exposed to this coronavirus. The Red Cross is not testing donors to diagnose illness. An antibody test assesses whether your immune system has responded to the infection. To schedule an appointment, please visit www.redcrossblood.org. Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Effective today, July 13, same day reservations are accepted by phone for lap swim and water walk lanes at Belfar Aquatic Center's indoor pool. Belfar residents, season passes, and punch card holders refer receive first priority and may call between eight, nine o'clock in the morning and 10. All other users may call beginning at 10 a.m. To reserve any remaining available line, lanes for that particular day, reservations are accepted on a first come, first come basis. Swimmers with reservations enter the facility on the hour, access the Pell for 45 minutes, and exit the facility by the 50 minutes after the hour. This allows for 10 minutes of cleaning and sanitizing between groups. Changing rooms are not available. All patrons must abide by the regulations established 
in the current Los Angeles County Health Officer order. For reservations, please call 562 area 866-2015. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, Council Member Sonny Santinez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Now that the Belvoir, Belvoir Aquatic Center is open for limited use, we have some safe summer programs. The Summer Splash is a two-day mini camp on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for Belvoir residents ages 6 to 12. Fee is $10 per person per session. Activities include craft, stroke drills, and techniques in aquatic theme games and activities. All children must be able to swim 25 yards without assistance. Children must come wearing a face mask and be dressed ready to swim. Children must also bring their own labeled bottled water and towels. When in the water, children will not be expected to wear masks. However, when out of the water, social distancing protocols will be enforced at all times. Registration is available online at activenet.active.com forward slash Belfar Recreation. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Santinez. Uh, Councilmember Raymond Hamada. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First off, good evening, Belfar. Um, the, the farmer's market is now open. The city of Belfar operates an outdoor certified farmer's market at the corner of Clark Avenue and Oak Street in the Sims Park parking lot. <laughs> the market is open every Monday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. except for holidays and offers a wide selection of fresh produce, bread, flowers, and more. Food vendors also sell a variety of tasty items including tamales and hummus. The market accepts EBT, face coverings, and social distancing measures are required for entrance. For more information, call 562-804-1424 at extension 2331. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member Hamada. Uh, Council Member Ray Dutton. Thank you, Mayor Garza. If you, let me get my glasses on. If you are interested, interested in receiving the Bellflower eCitizen newsletter, you can sign up on our website. This newsletter includes updates, special events, community news, health and safety information. To subscribe, visit our website at www.bellflower.org. And then you scroll to the bottom of the page, of the home page, and then click on the eCitizen newsletter letter block. Enter your email address and click submit. That's all you got to do. After that, you will receive the newsletter on a weekly basis. If you have any qu questions or assistance, please call 562-804-1424 at extension 2010. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Dutton. Okay, <coughs> item number 10, public comments. Mr. Stewart. This is, the, this is the time set aside for the public to address the City Council on matters not listed on the agenda. <clears throat> Those wishing to speak on an agenda item must utilize one of the me methods listed on page two of the agenda. You will be given three minutes to address the City Council. Attempts to provide comment at times not designated on the agenda may result in the City dropping you from the meeting. Thank you so much, Mrs. Stewart. Um, if you would like to speak, please use a raise hand feature. If by computer, it appears under the Participants tab. If by phone app, it will appear under the More button at the bottom right hand corner. Or if you're by telephone, please press star nine to raise your hand. You will be called upon by the deputy city clerk in the order received. You can then unmute your microphone so that you can provide your comments. Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have any members of the public who wish to make comments at this point in time? Yes, Mayor, we do. Um, the first speaker is Vicki Myers. Ms. Myers, if you will give me just a moment to put the timer on the screen and then you sure. can begin. Can you hear me? Yes, yes welcome, welcome Ms. Myers. Okay, let me know when you want me to start. Just one moment, please. Okay, okay go ahead, Ms. Myers. Good evening, Mayor Garza, Bellflower City Council members and City of Bellflower officials and staff. My name is Vicki Myers and I reside at 9956 Walnut Street in Bellflower. 
I've lived and been employed in Bellflower for about 35 years. My concern tonight is with illegal fireworks and the inability of our leaders to effectively mitigate the annual escalation of this dangerous and lawless activity. Taxpayers have the right to expect actionable plans that result in a noticeable decline in this illegal activity and an increased confidence in public safety. I have written twice to the mayor, the sheriff's department and public safety. Each individual responded quickly, respectfully and informatively. However, the nightly neighborhood bombardment of literal explosions continued up to and through July 4th. To a lesser degree, it still continues. Many res residents have shared their stories multiple times on the Bellflower Crime Prevention Facebook group and it's clear that some city officials have access to the group as it is sometimes used as a platform to convey information to the community. I see this as one possible way for city leaders to hear from citizens as well. Throughout this time, residents were urged to continue reporting this crime to the non-emergency number at the Sheriff's Department. But why? They don't come, they just don't come. I was also told a variety of things during my call, such as it's only an infraction. On another call, it is a misdemeanor, but the most likely outcome will be confiscation and possibly a citation. Another call, officers had to witness the crime. And I'm wondering what happened to see something, say something. On the Bellflower Crime Prevention Tips Facebook group, Residents called when they actually witnessed their neighbors shooting off harmful objects that landed on rooftops and the criminals were not questioned. And let's be clear, those responsible are criminals and they should face the penalties the law allows. In conclusion, I respectfully ask each of you if you have done your due diligence by becoming fully informed on this citywide issue from May 20th through the, president, through the present. How many calls reporting this legal activity were received? How many officers were dispatched? How many reports were written? How many times were fireworks confiscated? And how many times were either of the fire stations dispatched? I hope that by studying official records, our leaders will begin researching solutions that will avoid the same serious lawless next, next year. And I ask that you communicate your efforts in a variety of formats, formats that will keep interested citizens informed on what is being done. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much for your comments, Ms. Myers. Um, I'm not sure Mr. Mr. Hawkman or Mr. Stewart may have some comments. I know that this year was a uh, pretty uh, record setting in terms of the amount of uh, illegal fireworks that were emitted not only here in our city, but throughout our region as well. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any follow-up to uh, the data that Ms. Ms. No, Mike. I know it's a point of contention among all the city managers in the area. They were all sort of struggling and scratching our heads how to go forward. I'm hoping in the next few months we come up with a plan that's more effective. Okay. I don't have any answers right now, though. I wish I did. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think uh, to her point, it may be a good idea for us to be able to get some sort of idea of a report uh, in terms of how well, I think Mr. Hockman is planning to make a report out on this issue. Perfect. So okay. there you go. Great. Th Mr. Mayor, if I may. Oh, there, there he is. I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Yes, Hockman. Mr. Hockman. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, a consensus among cities in the region, actually, that this was the worst year that they could remember, my colleagues, as far as leading up to the 4th of July. In fact, in Bellflower, we had three times, roughly three times the number of calls for service as we had last year. SAOs were reporting that the number of illegal fireworks for sale far exceeded past years. And in fact, the model used was large, uh, somebody might get a large shipment of illegal fireworks and then use, you know, more or less Uber type drivers, drivers, delivery drivers to, to take small quantities of these uh, fireworks here, there, there, and there. So it was a new animal this year in terms of the illegal fireworks phenomenon. And uh, we made several arrests uh, which resulted in citations and confiscations of those illegal fireworks, which prevented thousands of noises from going off, quite frankly. Total citations issued this year were 54, I believe, by our team, which was just about the same as uh, our neighbor to the south. And uh, a number of patrols were out two weeks in advance of the fourth. 
extra cars on the fourth. But one of our disadvantages this year was we had three deputies who were going out on the fourth that had COVID exposure at the last minute and so weren't able to go. And that cut down our uh, fourth of July response by a unit, which would have been another 10, 12 or 15 sites. So it's a, it was a, it was a rough year. Quite frankly, I feel for all of the residents, both in Bellflower and across Southern California, because it, it was different. It was different this year. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. I think Mr. Dutton had some comments. I'm not sure. Well, yeah, it was because I've been, I've been battling emails from my constituents too and then responding to them. And I knew there was special patrols that started two weeks and a little bit sooner than that. Um, I live in the same area as Ms. Myers and random stuff, 11 at night, two in the morning, three at the morning, you never know when it was gonna come. And it started like 30 days before the fourth and continues and then it's, it's I think they're running out because it's, it's lessened, but it's still going on. But again, you're, you're, you're trying to catch somebody in the dark and you get a call and then if you get enough calls, then you'll case a house or whatever in an area and then you can you know, investigate it until you finally you know, see someone do it. And at one point, I, one of the reports that we got was that there was cars driving around and they would stop at an intersection and, and then light off some stuff and then take off. You know, how do you answer that? But uh, it, it is a problem and, and, uh, and I'm as informed as you guys are. You got the same reports I do of what was doing it. And uh, so we are informed and we know we have a problem. And like uh, Joel Hockman said, their public safety director is we got to think outside the box and try to compact something, combat something different next year. Any, any comments, Mr. Hamada? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, I can vouch for, uh, again, what happened on the 4th. I, I did uh, uh, join in with the sheriff of, for a couple hours. And I'll use the, the term war zone. It, it, it was, it, I wouldn't call it spectacular, but it was constant. And you could just do a, a 360 degree turn around and and see it going constantly uh, so as we got in the the undercover unit that was of great benefit because you could get right up close to somebody because they just think you're one of the neighbors or something they want to wave you by but you're actually kind of waiting for it to happen and sure enough it happened multiple times during the time I was with uh, the new sergeant and uh, one of the officers, and um, uh, they were writing citations. They were, they were confiscating. Uh, they made every effort under uh, each condition. There was one that was pretty dicey, where the crowd came to about thirty people and converged on the two officers. And fortunately, it was quiet. Ended up quiet, and uh, uh, the citation was issued and uh, moved on. But. As soon as you make the turn, get in the vehicle, make the turn, there's another one. And you, you, there's another one. And uh, 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 what, I, what I did personally to try to, uh, again, try to help out, again, uh, for, the, for the month before, again, I got calls too from um, the District 1 uh, residents. And uh, so I put together a list of hot spots for the sheriffs to follow up on and uh, th they were able to do that so um, yeah it's just more and more more eyes out there obviously uh, yeah we did have that extra unit um, yeah, but um, it's I'll tell you it was it's way too much to handle it there's uh, the volume versus the personnel out there uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that you know we were able to get what we could but uh, and uh, easily it could have been much much more but it's just a matter of getting there yeah so okay thank you mr mayor thank you mr mata i'm not sure if there's any other comments mr saninas yeah thank you mr mayor uh ms mayor just a couple of things i want to add um um you recall that we increased the the penalty uh from one thousand to two thousand dollars and it seems like uh, it's really not becoming a deterrent so we need to find a different solution to, to combat this issue. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is there is value in reporting suspected uh, people f um, firing fireworks. Um, they, the, the sheriff may not be able to, to act on it right away, but um, given the data that they can accumulate, they might be able to pinpoint at some point in time, especially the weeks leading to 4th of July. So that data should be coming to the sheriff's department because they can accumulate that and use it to 
to apprehend or give citation to whoever is firing firework. Um, the analogy that I that this was used to uh, before by a uh, deputy sheriff to me a while back when I did a ride along is is just like going fishing on Fourth of July. There's so many fish out there, and uh, just like if you go on uh, on a fishing expedition, you can only catch so so much fish. So it's not because of lack of trying, but um, I know that the sheriff's department has been trying their best to um, to give citation to all those who fire um, illegal fireworks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Saninez. We've ever had, and uh, as all of you were in town that night, you could hear and see what we saw. I did hear that one of the best places to go to see fireworks being displayed was at the top of our new parking structure where you'd have a 360 degree view of the whole city, which uh, made it look like Beirut. But uh, nevertheless, we were uh, inundated. I guess the we need to be more proactive on trying to keep these illegal fireworks out of town. How do you do that? Uh, it doesn't seem to be any deterrent to shoot them off. Everybody that has them uh, has no concern for what happens to their house, the neighbor's place, the, the animals, the windows, or anything else. But we need to figure out a way how do we uh, serve as interdiction on this stuff. But uh, I, I got the same emails, got the same phone calls that we all have, and we take responsibility and we need to do better. And uh, I appreciate the call this evening. Thank you, Mayor Pritton. I, I just I want to echo that. I really appreciate Ms. Myers bringing this up. I know that we had a couple exchanges over emails. Um, I know Mr. Hockman himself was really helpful, but I, I think it's another example of how 2020 really is an unprecedented year in many ways. Um, and I think what we experienced with the fireworks is, again, another another reflection of that. Um, and it, the good news for us, I think, if there's a good news in this, is that we have a year to figure this out, to Mr. Uh, Mr. Kutz's point. So uh, I know it's a year, it's an annual event. It, it happens this year was, absolutely unprecedented and so uh, the mandate is upon us now to be able to figure this out for next year and to be able to uh, curb this as much as possible and maybe some of the ideas like a uh, council member something has brought up maybe that's something that this council needs to re-explore is is making those fines a deterrent um, we'll explore different ways and again mrs myers thank you so much for your your comments this evening madam deputy city clerk do we have any other members of the public wishing to make comments this evening Ms. Myers, did you have your hand raised again? I did. I just wanted to say two things about what I was just listening to. And one is that I did want to reiterate that I, I did very much appreciate the timely and informative feedback that I did get from the city officials um, and, um, and the sheriff's department and the mayor. And, um, and also that um, it, in the research that I was doing myself, there were there were some other areas that had an an email set up where people could start uh, when they knew something was going, sending in uh, the the likely location so that as the fireworks started, um, they could start mapping out target areas. And I wanted to share that because I don't I mean I don't know. I thought it was a good idea and it seemed to be helpful in the area that I was uh, reading about. Um, and that's basically where I was going was, let's not breathe a sigh of relief that it's over this year because I know how that goes as well as a former school district employee, kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Okay, we got through that and no major issues, but let's try to figure out what we can do to uh, make a difference next year and thank you very much for hearing me tonight absolutely, absolutely. thank you thank for you your comments, comments and for joining us, us. Madam, Madam you. Deputy Clerk. Uh, yes mayor i'll give the public just a moment to utilize the feature no mayor i'm not seeing any other comment at this time thank you so much Madam deputy city clerk and again a uh, special thanks to miss mars this evening uh, let's move on to item number 11A, Mr. Stewart. This is the first of two public hearings tonight. The, this one is consideration of possible action to conduct a public hearing to consider placing delinquent refuse service charges onto the tax roll and adopt resolution number 90-38, a resolution ordering delinquent refuse service charges be assessed against the property owners and properties and such charges be transferred to the county tax rolls 
Mr. Enigmas is here at the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. For background, CRNR provides solid waste and recycling services in the City of Bellflower. CRNR bills customers directly for these services, and then refuse bills become delinquent if they are not paid within 30 days. The Bellflower Municipal Code defines the procedures for the collection of delinquent refuse service charges. Also, the City retains 10% of delinquent amounts collected in order to cover administrative charges. In accordance with the Municipal Code, on May 31st, CRNR provided a list of delinquent accounts. On June 5th, CRNR provided a notice to customers with delinquent accounts. And on June 15th, the city provided notice to property owners with delinquent accounts. On June 25th and July 2nd, a notice of public hearing was published in the Herald American newspaper. Before you tonight will be a public hearing. Should the council approve tonight's item, the last day for payment to CRNR will be July 23rd. The final list would then be transmitted to the county by August 10th. The tables before you illustrate a comparison between last year's delinquent accounts and those for this year. For this year, as of May 31st, there were 434 delinquent accounts for a total of $84,775. As of July 1st, that number was reduced to 296 delinquent accounts for a total of $64,190. Staff recommends that the City Council open the public hearing, take testimonial and documentary evidence. After considering the evidence, adopt resolution number 20-38 or alternatively, discuss and take other action related to this item. This concludes my staff report and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Inguez, this evening. Um, I understand that we received uh, a, a letter a regarding contesting do, do you want to touch on that right now? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if I should do it now or when the public hearing is open. So we did receive a letter. It's for uh, property at uh, 16922 Bellflower Boulevard, known as Frank's Restaurant. Uh, apparently, the tenant that was there before sold the business but did not pay their respective trash bills. Therefore, CRNR did provide the property owner with the delinquency notice for over uh, $2,000, uh, $2,258.70. The owner of the property is contesting that since they did not owe the amount that it should be the prior tenant that should be responsible. However, the uh, property owner does get that notice of delinquent accounts because they are ultimately responsible for, for the tenants that use their property. So that, that is the challenge that was uh, submitted. So that's going to be, I guess, handled as part of the process. That doesn't hold anything up tonight. Isn't the previous, isn't the previous owner of the business responsible for that bill? In the past, the uh, property owner has been held responsible, and that might be a city attorney question, since this is a commercial account. Well, I think we got well, the answer to that. When so. I, d I do know for a fact from when past experience, when we, you seen this? When, when we don't, when they rent the house and the tenant leaves, the property owner is, pays the bill. We lien the house for the for a rental house. It would be the same for rent and commercial. Yeah. I'm just hoping to get some clarity before yeah. we yeah. do a final decision. Correct. So based on the information we've gotten, okay. uh, we should work with the uh, property owner so that they would not be held responsible. So CRNR would have to work and collect that amount from the prior tenant. I can say from personal experience, when I actually, um, like when I purchased my home here in Bellflower years ago, uh, there was a substantial amount of back um, trash, bi uh, you know, bills that were, I guess, owed by the prior owner. And I also had that experience where that was trying to be imposed upon me as the new owner. And I was able to work with CRNR and they were able to, to work on that and, and not um, place it on me. So I, there is precedent there. So it's good work. Recommendation would be to remove this property from the resolution and let CRNR and the city work with the new property owner. Okay. Okay. 
Great, so, great. so I'll, I'll, I'll recommend I'll re for that to, to take place. Now, I got a yeah. question for the city attorney. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Hey, Carl, hey, Carl in, the in the past, we've, we've had residences that uh, were delinquent because there were rentals, and we've had the owners come in here contesting it. In the bottom line, we've always leaned the properties of rental property. There's no difference between rental residential and rental commercial. I would have to look at, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I would have to look at each of those accounts separately. Mm -hmm. It depends on how the the landlord-tenant relationship was set up. If, for example, the landlord paid the, mm -hmm. the service bill, then the the property owner would be responsible for that bill, even though he was passing it on to the tenant or, or receiving compensation from the tenant. The issue here is, is that the, uh, the original property owner conveyed the property before the property was leaned so that the new property owner is not responsible for the previous bill. It's, it's unfortunately not a bright line mm -hmm. issue. What's our or ordinance say that the property owner is responsible for delinquent trash bills? The resolution correctly states what the law is, which is if the customer and the property owner are one and the same, then we can lean the property. But if the property owner and the customer are not the same, it's the, the customer's personal debt. Got, got. So past practice hasn't been good. I, I would never, I would never comment on past practice. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe, the, the, maybe we've changed something. Mr. Dunn, do you have yeah. any more questions? That's it. Okay, uh, Mr. Sandinez. And uh, Bernie, can you show the other chart, please? Um, when you have the schedule of schedule of events. Okay, so on the second and the third bullet point, there's a distinction between the customer and the owner. So I think there's a reason for that. Because if we are following the uh, suggestion of the city attorney, there should be no more notice to the owner. It stops at the customer level. Right? Uh, well, th this has been... Our, our I know there's a logic to that yeah. because I, I think there's a logic to that because well, the ultimate per, uh, part responsible is the owner. I think I don't think we should get into how the the uh, the lease agreement was constructed. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be policing lease agreements. Well, the point of lien and right? property, the point of lien in the property is to secure your funds at one day. <laughs> one day you're going to get paid. Yeah, but because my point is. That disagreement should be between the two parties, the tenant and the mm -hmm. landlord. Why, we why will we be examining the lease agreement? To me, if the customer cannot pay, then the owner should be held responsible. And I think based on that schedule, there's a logic to that. If the, own if the customer cannot pay or will not pay, then the customer, the owner, becomes responsible. There is a way to uh, amend the municipal code so that we can actually have that type of relationship, but that language does not yet exist in the municipal code. Okay, okay. I, think, I, think, I, I think we need to fix that because it's, it's it, we're trying to make it confusing, but to me it's straightforward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I guess the question, I may be wrong in this, but the question is if we're gonna fix this, do we wanna fix it Continue this and do it later, or do we want to proceed tonight? The council, I, I think that you can move forward with this particular resolution tonight. Uh, there is a timing issue with regard to getting this on the tax rolls. The one issue only has to do with this uh, property, as far as I, I know, and then we will schedule uh, updates to the municipal code at the next available meeting. Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor, Mayor, I can make a suggestion. Yes, Since there's only one official protest, I think uh, we'll probably give a uh, staff direction to negotiate to negotiate this between CRNR and the customer or the owner. The staff and the city attorney okay with that? Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see, council member, I mean, Mayor Potente, please. Yes, thank you. Yes. You, uh, 
<laughs> get stuck. Get stuck with a <laughs> trash bill on a delinquent account. I always include the amount of the trash bill in a lease because it's ultimately <laughs> your responsibility to pay it. So they pay it every month as part of the rent. That's the smartest way. Now, in the situation that we're addressing right now, we all know that uh, that's a pretty prominent property here in Bellflower, and there was a buy-sell agreement between the guy that was selling it, Bronk, and the new guy, and that should have been caught in escrow because there were, this was the only debt on that place. And so he has to bear some of the responsibility, or the escrow company does, because this was not a, a fly-by-night deal. This transaction went on for two or three years, probably all during the time it was in escrow. He didn't pay the trash bill. So this is a little different situation than most. But ultimately, the gentleman who built the property is going to be responsible for the trash bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Uh, Council Member Raymond Hamada. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I'd, I'd hope my, when I bought my house, that <coughs> didn't have all the added, but, uh, but you know, I bought it in probate, so I probably paid more than what I should have anyway. But uh, um, uh, Bernie, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, things. Um, is this a typical year, the number of uh, delinquencies, or because of COVID, has it jumped a large percentage? It's lower now? It is lower? Actually, it, it's been typical, typical because it, it takes 90 days for it to be delinquent. Yeah, Therefore, there's I, I'm thinking for the next year cycle, we, yeah. we might see some uh, variances in the ah, numbers. All right, yeah. Then it, Okay. Um, Ray, you were thinking historically, the last year to this year. Well, yeah, just in past years. It's but I can remember these things would be yeah. eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Not sixty seems like a pretty low amount. Yeah. Well, at this yeah. point in time, it's just. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I mean, this this is a standard process in like other cities, and I, right. I've seen yeah large amounts too. Um, but um, um. It looks. Uh, oh, the other question was. Um, our 10% is that is that collected prior to that July 3rd, the last day payment, or once it gets transferred to the rolls and it paid off somehow, then we will get that 10% later. That, that's correct. Okay. That's part of our transmittal. Yeah. To All right. Good. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. <coughs> um, any more questions from side before we open up the public hearing? Yeah, I'd make a mo motion. We open the public hearing. Second. All right, so is a motion by Council Member Dutton and a second by Mayor Pro Tem Coops to open up the public hearing without objection. That will be the order. Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have any, have members, any members of the of public wishing to make comment regarding item 11A? I would. Is it possible that I speak? I'm sorry, I don't see a hand raised, so I'm not sure who that who is speaking. I apologize. I don't know how to use Zoom. I'm sorry. Okay. My name is Gus. Oh, okay. Mr. Frisakis, um, if you will let me, um, you'll just give me a moment to get the screen up here, the timer, and then you can go ahead and begin. Thank you very much. I apologize. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Frisakas. Thank you for your time, uh, City Council members. I appreciate the moment to speak. Um, yes, I have the dubious um, honor to be the highest number on this on this list. And uh, unbeknownst to me, we just received the uh, the letter from CNR and R on the fifteenth of uh, this last month, and this is the first I've ever heard about it. I think I heard one of the council members saying, yes, some of this should have been done through the, the escrow, and, and I would agree with you there. Um, but um, given the, the, the fact that we were never aware of it, it was never brought up to our attention that the, the account was actually delinquent, at that time we could have certainly took some type of action, make something happen and, and force the hand of the tenant, we would have been happy to do so. Um, and in the section it does say, and I think the, um, the attorney, Mr. Berger, said that um, you know, if the customer and the property owner are the same, in this case, the customer and the property owner are, are completely separate. Um, and with the logic on that, it 
say for for example, the, the tenant were to get in some type of a agreement with a supplier, if they were to renege on that, it, it's still all these type of um, delinquencies, so to speak, I don't think would be fair to, to fall upon the landlord. Now, um, if in fact there is a, I, I think, you know, a little bears on CNR, CRNR to perhaps contact the property owners directly as opposed to giving them the bill when this is all said and done. Um, I'm hoping that their language would be clarified. I, I would realize and understand that if a property owner does not pay their bills, eventually they should, and they're the ones that have set up the contract with the with the entity of CNR or whoever it is, they just certainly should get um, dinged for that one way or the other. But in this case, I had no clue or no idea of any delinquencies that have taken me up to this point. So I would, you know, I would be very happy to work with CNR and R. Like I said, we're we're not one not to pay our bills, but in this case, this is literally not a bill that has ever been presented to me. Nor, you know, in the lease, it specifically says all utilities and everything are on top of the tenant, and um, you know, property taxes and the such are something that we take um, that we pay, and that's something that we will do. But uh, they are completely separate and, and, and different in this case. Again, thank you for your time. I appreciate your your, your sentiment, and um, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Rosakis. Uh, staff, any comments to what you mentioned? No, uh, we'll, we'll move forward and make sure, pull it from the uh, roll, and make sure that CRNR basically collects from the uh, tenant, okay. prior tenant. And to address that, but yeah, not a problem. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy City Clerk, any other uh, comments from members of the public regarding item 11A? No, I don't see any other public comments at this time. Great, great. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for that, Madam uh, Deputy City Clerk. Move we uh, close the public hearing. Perfect. Second. All right, so there's a motion and a second. Motion by Council Member Dutton, second by Mayor Pro Tem Coops, and without objection, to close the public hearing without objection, that will be the order. Gentlemen, any final questions, comments? You ready for a motion? Yes, sir, if there's none. I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 20-38, a resolution ordering delinquent re refused service charges be assessed against the property owners and properties and such charges be transferred to the county tax rolls. So I have a motion by Mayor Plotin Coops. Is there a second? Second. W with the one exception. With the, uh, with the one exception that yeah. we talked about with Bronx. All right. Thank you. So I have a motion by Mayor Plotin Coops, second by Council Member um, Hamada. Roll call, please. Councilmember Dutton? Aye. Councilmember Hamada? Aye. Councilmember Santanez? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Coops? Aye. Mayor Garza? Aye. Thank you so much for that, Madam City Clerk. Uh, item 11B, Mr. Stewart. This is the second public hearing. It's consideration possible I should conduct a public hearing to read by title only way further reading introduce ordinance number 1394, an ordinance establishing the development agreement zone overlay or DAZZLE and amending title 17 of the Belfar Municipal Code. And I believe Viv Corpus is on site today, or we'll call in and make the staff report. Okay, good evening, honorable, honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, just to confirm, can you hear me okay? And do you see my PowerPoint on the screen? Yes, yes, uh, Ms. Corpus. Corpus. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the proposed ordinance would create a new chapter in the Bellflower Municipal Code entitled Development Agreement Zone Layover, for short, the DAZZLE. Not all projects fit neatly into the BMC zoning regulations, and the proposed DAZZLE provides flexibility for otherwise strict development or sign regulations applicable to the underlying zone. Adoption of the DAZZLE would allow for a negotiated development agreement to alter require requirements of the underlying zone and an overlay zone would be created. The dazzle is considered a floating zone because once the need is identified, the dazzle can be activated for a specific property. The proposed ordinance outlines general requirements for the dazzle. 
the dazzle may be combined with underlying with any underlying zone. Land uses allowed on a site within the dazzle are limited to those specified in the development agreement. Land use permit requirements in the primary zone apply unless otherwise specified in the development agreement. Development and land use standards on a site within the dazzle can be established through this process. And then lastly, the zoning map must be amended to show the overlay designation once the dazzle is activated for a specific property. In summary, this ordinance provides flexibility to existing zoning and land use regulations. The ordinance streamlines development the development process for future developments within the city. The approval of the dazzle and any development agreement associated with it rests solely within the city council's discretion. And the ordinance is consistent with the general plan and helps implement several goals and policies of the general plan land use element. The recommendation this evening is to open the public hearing, take testimonial and documentary evidence, and after considering the evidence, read by title only, wait for the reading, and introduce ordinance number 1394 or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Corpus, for that report. Um, let's start off with uh, Council Member Raymond Hamada. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First off, Elizabeth, thank you for the report. Um, so Dazzle. <laughs> um, trying to get a handle on like where, like what zones would it, I mean, right now the way it's reading, it looks like it can go anywhere, unless we're focusing on, on you know, um, major development projects or are we looking at certain size properties or is it where we feel it can work, it, uh, it, it has possibilities um, or is it, just focusing on commercial, uh, like industrial, uh, and how different does this come across? Well, I, I, I know a DA you know, works well on a lot of things, but we also have in town, you know, uh, you know, plan development areas, precise plans, and how does this all kind of work together if, 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 uh, if it's if it's applied over something that already has it, um, and does that over does that dazzle uh, supersede uh, anything else below it, uh, which which could have a like a PD on it or or something else? And um, when it gets to uses and uh, uses maybe out of character that maybe apply and again maybe the, well let's start with maybe the zone first, and then from there, uh, there might be some other questions. Sure, so Council Member Hamada, the dazzle is written, it's it's fairly flexible. It could be applicable to any zone. All right. So it is open-ended in that it could be commercial, industrial, or residential. Um, it's another tool that the planning staff would have if there's a development that the city desired to have and it couldn't fit within the existing zoning regulations, this is simply a tool that we have to negotiate with the developer on certain, um, on certain alterations to the requirements of the zone. And so just think of, as you will, if there's a specific project that you, um, a specific project that's fairly large that wanted to go into a specific property that couldn't quite meet the development standards, but there was a, a, a reason why it couldn't, then the developer could apply for the dazzle. This would then be essentially a zone change for the overlay to go on top of it. Uh, through a negotiated development agreement, we could specify the type of land uses that would be permitted on that property. We could even specify the type of permit applications required to process that type of development. So it is really a flexible tool for us to uh, somewhat deviate from the zoning regulations 
um, but in a way that creates a process for the developer to go through that could not only be flexible in terms of the regulations, um, but also streamline the process so that it's negotiated through the DA and then to the council for final approval. So hopefully that answers some of your questions. Please let me know if you'd like more clarification. Were, Were uh, um, you envisioning that it would be applied to a larger parcel or could a like a 10,000 square foot lot work if 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 we're looking for something in particular or or are we or or, or are we encouraging more so with dazzle larger developments so meaning larger properties i i think the goal is to look at the bigger projects but that doesn't necessarily limit it to just those bigger projects uh, it could be for smaller projects as well uh, when it comes to specifying uses, and um, sometimes, uh, well, for many years, it's uh, the question of spot zoning and putting uses where they maybe shouldn't be. Um, is that any any potential problem with this? Uh, well, the way the the general requirements in the, in the dazzle is written is that the underlying land uses would be applicable unless it's specifically outlined in the development agreement. Um, so in terms of the land uses, you could take all of the land uses that are allowable in the underlying zone and make it applicable in the dazzle, or you can take specific ones. So for example, if there's some land uses that you think this project should be limited to, you could reduce that larger list to something smaller. Okay. So it does allow the council to essentially determine what type of use should be on that property. And of course, you would also have to make all the required findings in order to allow for that type of use to go there. All right, so, so a dazzle could be in a say within a larger zoned area it could be it could be an island within that zone again, again depending, depending on, on the, the need, need uh, or um, you know the property what it what it could uh, have you know possibilities with what, what i mean what i want is to again uh, not have anybody say hey you know we're just creating these spots that are, you know, just, you know, able to do any, anything per the DA without, you know, and then everybody around it, uh, you know, says, you know, why can't I? And then, or they'll have to do it too, and, and so on and so on. So um, rather than lot by lot, are we potentially looking at larger areas, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, contain multiple properties, or is it just one one property? Or yes. are we waiting, waiting for, for a developer, developer on, on a single, single property to deal with it, and then say, okay, you know, let's let's dazzle it, and then move forward. So the purpose is that you can identify certain sites or areas within right, the city. Okay, okay. So it is both. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, um, and well, and the last question and um, timeline: Are, do, Is this a, a rush, uh, you know, procedure? Are we Are needing we need it sooner than later, or we're just we're just trying to develop the list of, of uh, flexible opportunities that a developer can move forward uh, during uh, during this you know, harder time? to develop and, and uh, move things forward? Uh, we, we are trying to develop that list to be more flexible, but there is a specific uh, development that could benefit from this, absolutely. And, uh, and that particular project is in the works, but this is also a step that the 
project is waiting on to also pass. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's a, a nice large project. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Hamada. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. hear you. When we when did we that project last week on Belfar Boulevard at the Greek Market, 93 units with the uh, four movie theaters and the chance to go uh, with five stories in height, and we call that a specific plan project, to me that gives us a lot of flexibility. So I'm wondering with this dazzle, how many tools in the toolbox do we need? I'm reminded of more than once when Mr. Dutton and I have been on committees whereby an applicant has asked for a certain use of the property and it's not appropriate because of the zone in the area in the city. And we would say, no, that can't be done. Will this circumvent that possibility? I'm thinking about people that like to put car washes in places that we may not always enjoy them. I mean, our, you understand my concern is how, how many tools do we need to have and how many are going to be used against us to try to put together a project that we can't defend? We've, we've never, never had, had this before. before. Do, do any other any cities, are, are we again, has Belfire is always first? <laughs> are, is this again one of the things that we're cutting new ideas on. What do you, what think? Do you uh, think? Council Member Coops, and I apologize, I might have missed some of your um, previous questions, but I don't think this is something that's unique to our city. Um, if you look at it, it's 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 an overlay zone. Uh, essentially, it is an overlay zone, and our code has several overlay zones already within the city, um, including the Belfar Village overlay zone, the Belfar Laundra mixed use zone. So there are already a lot of overlay zones in the city and there are other areas in the city where we have specific plans. So we are trying to have this mechanism to be more flexible. We have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of overlays. We have a lot of specific plans. This would be another tool for us to adopt um, in terms of the, in terms of having a development agreement overlay zone. Or yeah, yeah, I think, I think what Mr. Mr. Coops is concerned about is he doesn't want to develop another overlay zone that overlays another one and makes it a less restrictive use than it's currently there. Um, so with the exception of the overlay zones that we have on Belfar Boulevard, would Dazzle supplant those or is it, is it a supplicant to those existing overlay zones? Um, it could supersede those, so let me, it could be combined with those overlay zones, or it could be standalone. So, so what if what there if was there a conflict, and what he's going to specifically is the DFD of Belfar Boulevard, would Dazzle supersede the DFD, or does the DFD stand alone? Um, let me just take a look at the ordinance, but I believe if there's a conflict, then the Dazzle would supersede it. Yeah. Let me just check that. Well, you well, know, you we've, know had we've had some, some pretty aggressive discussions about certain properties. And Beth, secondarily to that, is the Dazzle, is it a developer's choice to apply the overlay zone or is that staff's choice to apply the overlay zone? What triggers it? It could be the developer, it could be both, but it, if it was a developer's choice, there would have to be some discussion on if the city council would even initiate this zone for that property um, because it is ultimately up to council whether or not they want to activate that dazzle on that. That's zone. that's that's the that is that, the safe then, right? So the council has the oversight to activate that zone when and where they want to. So there's no problem of it not coexisting with the current overlay zone, right? That's correct. Got it. Got it. Yes. Right, thank, thank you. you. That kind of interprets what I was, but you know what I'm concerned for. <laughs> all right. That's all my questions, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Uh, Council Member Santinez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just a follow up on Dan on your question and, and Ray uh, Council Member Hamada's question. I, I'm still not clear in terms of what we can accomplish out of Dazzle that we cannot accomplish through overlay zone, a specific plan, and our typical development agreement. I, it seems like we all we already have those tools. So, what I'm trying to get is what else can Dazzle give us? that those current tools cannot give us at this time. Council member Santi Inez, for the overlay zones, um, those are within certain areas of the city and most of the overlay zones are concentrated in the downtown area. Um, so right now there is that option for mm -hmm. the developer to either go with the underlying zone, which could be commercial or town center or residential, or could choose to go with the overlay zones. And those are defined areas. Um, specific plans, those are typically in larger areas where there is a, um, a larger vision for that area. For example, we adopted the West Artesia specific plan, which at the time was meant to be for um, big box retail type of uses. Um, so if there's something that couldn't fall within the overlay zone, or it's something that couldn't necessarily fall within a specific plan or proposed specific plan, this is also an option to cover uh, to cover uh, it from a land use perspective, as opposed to going through some type of variance. Or no, no. I think, I think, I think I the think question was, how does this interrelate with a development agreement and, a, and, a, and, an, over, and an overlay zone now? I mean, does this supersede the need for a development agreement in a specific overlay zone if applied? No, no, the, the question is, what can we not accomplish to overlay zone a specific plan and development agreement yeah. that we can hopefully that's get a, out of Dazzle? That's what I'm trying to get out. I think the Dazzle truncates that process. Beth, Sun, Sunny's question is germane, but what I'm trying to interpolate out of Dazzle is, does it get you out of the development agreement or does that still apply? No, the development agreement would apply. Still, still applies. applies. All right. Yes. So, so the, the, the question board, goes back, goes back to the original, original question, question is, what is what this, this gain us? us? Got it. So, it, well, it it's negotiated. So, it like, for example, for a specific plan, you don't necessarily need a development agreement. But for the Dazzle, you do need a development agreement because there could, could be some uses that you don't feel are appropriate to the site or you feel like there's more uses appropriate to the site. And that's how you would, the mechanism to do that would be through the development agreement, which would then create the overlay zone of the dazzle. Go further and answer the full question then. What does that gain aside from the, the underlying overlay zone? What does, what does dazzle, dazzle do? do? It allows you to not necessarily comply with every single zoning regulation that's in either the underlying zone or the overlay zone. Okay, okay. so it so also allows the council to truncate the overlay zone process and the specific plan process in that overlay zone by allowing not all those qualifications to be met in a dazzle zone that they pick, right? That's correct. So they so can, they see, can a see a product, product that, has that has merit, merit that, would that would not otherwise, not otherwise meet, meet the underlying, underlying overlay, overlay zone. zone. And they could choose, choose to apply Dazzle to that project, right? Correct. And, that, and that's, that's what that gains us. It's flexibility. So can't you accomplish that to a specific plan already? Well, what Beth was saying is that specific plans are usually for bigger products. These are for smaller scale projects than a big specific plan product. Is that what I'm reading into this? Uh, essentially, yes. Yes, but I, I do want to be clear that this could be used for both smaller projects and larger projects. Give us, Give us an, an example. example of something that we couldn't otherwise easily do in an overlay zone, say downtown, that you could do with Dazzle. That so, for what, example, what, 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 what kind of product would make it easier? Okay, so let's just take, for example, the um, let's just take, for example, the Serrano development. They came in after we adopted the transit-oriented development transit-oriented development-specific plan, but that site was already within an overlay. The overlay zone um, had some flexibility, but not all flexibility. 
So for example, if we needed additional flexibility then that overlays on provided, then we would go through the dazzle process to go through a development agreement to provide for that flexibility. So it could be a mixed use project, it could be a commercial project, it could be um, something, it, it could be any one of those type of project, but may not necessarily fall within the tools that we already currently have in the BMC. That goes, that goes back, back to Mr. Romano's question, how's that not spot zoning? This is a layover zone. So Got essentially it. it's a zone throughout the entire city until you activate it for an area or a specific property. So there, so there are, are identified, identified uses, uses within, within this layover, layover zone, zone the council, the council can, can activate by doing this, right? Development agreement process. Yes. And Ms. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is Carl. I, I should point out that this type of overlay zone has been challenged and has withstood court scrutiny at an appellate level. So this is not a first time through. Carl, Carl why don't you, you explain, explain what, is what is this gain, gain is, the, the council's looking pretty, pretty puzzled, puzzled here. How does, what is this gain? What flexibility does this gain the city council on these products? It, it gives them a chance to pick and choose and place products where they want to? Is that what it is? Well, I, I'm just gonna be very frank about this. Uh, the council entered into a lease agreement with bulletin displays about two, there three years go. ago. And as part of that lease agreement, the developer needs to have zone changes in for particular areas throughout the city. You can't apply a specific plan to specific plots throughout the city. It just right. That's not a way a specific plan does it. A specific plan requires there to be contig contiguous properties in order to, for it to be applied. Similarly, you can't really have an overlay zone for non-contiguous pieces of property. So rather than uh, really craft a specific zoning plan for, for this particular project, oh, okay. a development agreement would allow the city council to decide whether or not it wanted to have, for example, signs. And, and the idea for this actually came from a West Hollywood case, which I just mentioned was, was upheld by the courts involving signs. So it allows for the city council to make a determination on a sign by sign basis, basically, whether or not a sign should go into a particular area. And if so, it can be activated through this overlay zone with a development agreement. It's a legislative process, purely discretionary on behalf of the city council, but it does allow the flexibility for the city council to, des to decide whether these types of things are, are appropriate for particular areas within the city. I get it. I get it. That makes more sense. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I have. Yeah. Council Member Dutton. Thank you. I was trying to beat my head against the desk here. On past things, I, Elizabeth, on when we did the comedy club, we did some changes for that. I'm trying to get an example here of what we did. And we had to do parking. They didn't have enough parking. And we had to do maybe assembly use or something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we had to come up and have stuff come through to get stuff changed. Is that a project that Dazzle could have worked on to make staff get it ready for us to send to us? That could be, yes. Um, so for that specific project, we went through a use determination to determine that that type of use was public assembly. And then following that, there was um, a code amendment related to a parking. Mm -hmm. So essentially, yes, the Dazzle mm -hmm. could create mm -hmm. um, a mechanism that would allow for that parking would, to occur and without. Would, and would and that would kind of a thing make it easier for staff to to uh, process through to get it to the end development? Um, I believe so. Yes, okay. it, 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 yeah. there yeah. are all several paths to move forward, but yes, I do believe so. And yeah. I think we did the same thing with Steelcraft. I think there were some issues. I know parking was one of them and whatnot. I'm trying to think of some projects. I don't know if the cigar lounge had some issues too, you know, with that because it was liquor in a smoke lounge. I'm just trying to think these developments that we did, and I just need to know is it something that is easier done because we've already done it. 
because the N at the end where the final decision is the dais. Right. And so another another question. So the oh, what do you call it down by uh, Dunkin' Donuts? You have what uh, the redoing the pennies, the redoing all that. I know there's that's a big development there. Um, and one of the things you have to have 1.5 acres, and not all the parcels have 1.5 acres to develop it. Um, so when so something, something goes go out, something that can't come back. Is, is if if somebody if, say if a uh, developer acquired say three of the small buildings or something that that we see a project that we got this blight right there in the middle of Dunkin' Donuts and in the future Penny's building getting under a brewery. Um, you got three of them, but you only come up with a uh, acre and a quarter of property by getting those three. So this is something that could work that, you know, if we had, had a great project to get rid of those three ugly buildings and he was going to buy it and he's a little short on, on uh, acreage in the DFD that's there, is this a tool that could work that? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes, you're spot on there. Okay. Uh, okay. Because essentially the development agreement would be that tool. Okay. And... Yeah. The uh, project that is um, Vanessa's project at Cedar and the old Woody's Jerry Cedar and Bellflower Boulevard that's trying to get tenants right now. Um, there was a, there was an issue there. They were trying to acquire another building to make it flow better. I I think they worked it out, but is it is, this is something you can overlay that because it, that's in the DFD area over there also that you can do something t for the developer because you got a big project coming and you can you know when you're getting close you can make it go same thing yes and, and we do, we there. do we do still have the point system on uh residential remember we, remember did, we a, did a i don't know if you were here at that time we actually did uh it was the cottages on uh on the uh, walnut that we did a point system because the developer was there short on land, and we we come up with a point system for aesthetics of of make the the buildings look a lot better, um, and by achieving that, we were able to get another unit in there, and I recall that. I guess that was a plan development. Plan so that development. Also, yeah, yes, yeah. that's an also an, uh, another example on how we could use could, the could down. Do that. Okay, got, got it. it. Yes. That's what I remember. So. If that's the case, and, and the council has the final say, I think it'd be another, you know, tool on the tool on the on the shelf that you can pull down and and try to make stuff streamline. And would this is the kind of thing that would make it streamline a project with a developer and, and city hall? Is that correct? Yes. Because I'm, I'm all about, about moving things, things faster. Okay. That's it, Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Dutton. Um, no, frankly, most of my questions were were answered. Um, in the questions that I had were how are pro you know uh, properties selected, the process, who would be the actual selecting or initiating um, party in terms of designating the dazzle. Um, what does it cover? Like what areas of the city? Uh, again, I think most of the questions that were asked uh, this evening they've been addressed. Um, I I'm also not against. I'm for progress. I'm for thinking of, of innovative ways, and if we're doing some of these already, then um, that's fine. The one question that I did have, though, is in page – it's page four of the ordinance, but it's page six of the actual complete report. Um, on section six of the BMC, it, it, the last second line in that – that paragraph, it says, uh, the city is hereby divided into 16 zones known as the following. I only see two here. I'm not sure if I'm missing something. Um, where if I missed something for your report, Ms. Corpus, can you clarify on that? Are the zones, we didn't spell out each of those zones. So that would be like the R2 zone, the R3 zone, the CG. So the asterisks are basically uh, what leads up to the sense and the dazzle or the existing zones. Ah, ah, got it, got okay, it. That, okay. wasn't that wasn't clear, clear from the report. Okay, but thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so that move we open the public hearing. Great, thank you so much. Is there a second? Second.
So motion by uh, Councilmember Dutton and a second by uh, Councilmember, who is it? Coop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Councilmember <laughs> Hamada. I had <laughs> him over here. He <laughs> beat you by a split sec. Okay. Um, the public hearing is open. Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have anybody from the public wishing to make comments regarding item 11B? Yes, Mayor. I'll give the public just a moment to utilize that feature. Mayor, I'm not seeing any public comments at this time. Thank, Thank you so much, Madam Deputy City Clerk. Okay, so um, anybody wishes to make a motion to close the public hearing? All right, so I have a motion by Mayor Potent Coops. Second. And second by Council Member Santanez. Uh, gentlemen, what's your pleasure? I'd make, like to make a motion to uh, read by title only, wait for the reading, and introduce ordinance number 1394, an ordinance establishing a development agreement uh, zone overlay known as Dazzle and amending Title 17 of the Bellflower Municipal Code. All right. Do I have a motion? Is there a second? Second. I have a second. Motion by Councilmember Dutton, a second by Councilmember Hamada. Um, oh, and wait for the reading. Forgot to put that yeah. in there. And wait for the reading. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Dutton. Aye. Councilmember Hamada. Aye. Councilmember Santanez. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Aye. Mayor Garza. Aye. Thank you so much, Madam Deputies. I mean, Madam City Clerk. Um, I am going to at this point, and I'm sorry I didn't make this announcement before. Um, item 12A is tied to an item that I know we considered last time that we have a um, second reading for this evening. And I'm hoping to, uh, I want to take it out of order. I'd like to uh, have item 14K pulled from the consent calendar for us to consider now um, to discuss that because that will actually affect whether we discuss item 12A or not this evening. Um, so gentlemen, if you don't mind, can we um, consider item 14K at this point in time, please? And so with that, um, Ms. Corpus, uh, would you like to get, can you give a report on item 14K, please? Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, uh, 14K, Item 14K is related to the business recovery program. This is the second reading for adoption. So at your June 22nd city council meeting, uh, the council adopted an urgency ordinance, which became in effect immediately and introduced this regular ordinance, which tonight is the second reading for. So essentially the business recovery program is twofold. Um, given that we're in a state of emergency, um, we did think of ways to help streamline the development projects and also help businesses expand their areas into public rights away. So the two part process is that the first portion of the business recovery program was related to land use and planning decisions. And essentially with the way that the ordinance was written uh, with this first provision, it would be to have the city council act as the planning agency for all matters that were otherwise delegated to the planning commission. Um, and that was on a temporary basis until I believe June of 2021. So for a one year period. So essentially um, that section of the ordinance would basically mean that the city council review all items that would normally go to the planning commission or the design review committee. Uh, so that was the first step. The, or I'm sorry, that was the first part of the program. The second part of the program was related to establishing a permit process for outdoor dining and retail sales. Um, given the orders from the governor and also from the county there are limited opportunities for dining in and also for retail establishments in terms of their occupancy. So in order to give them more flexibility, the permitting program for outdoor dining and retail establishments was put in place so that they can expand their functions outdoors and in some cases in the city right away. So that ordinance was twofold. Um, part of the discussion that was included in that staff report um, I believe there were five bullet items for the council to provide direction on. 
Um, and those that related to um, the planning functions, it related to the dazzle, it related to administrative CUPs for parking agreements and liquor sales or alcohol sales. And I believe it also included the combining of the DRC and the planning commission function. So that second part was more of a discussion item so that we can get direction from the council to come back with a future amendment through public hearings and so on, or maybe even study sessions. Um, so essentially that is part, I'm sorry. So that covers what we reviewed at the June 22nd meeting. Um, this does relate to item 12A because uh, I do believe that there are some duties that the planning commission can still take care of instead of everything going to the council. And so um, 12A was a resolution that was being proposed so that some of those duties could be delegated back to the commission. Um, essentially, that is what how 14K and, and 12A relate. Um, and I'm happy to answer any kind of questions you have. Thank you so much, Ms. Corpus. So um, I think to your report, uh, these two items are related. And so I, again, I wanted to make sure that we address 14K first because depending on the way we vote on 14K, it'll affect whether we consider the, the need for considering 12A or not. Um, as being the person that I pulled this on 14K, I just wanted to share with my colleagues uh, my thoughts on 14K. Uh, if, if I recollect um, from our last discussion, I know it was, it was a, little, uh, a little sensitive regarding this item, but um, I remember there was a, a bit of a confusion from some of us in terms of exactly what was were, was being considered here in looking at, just in looking at the ordinance that's under 14K and under page two of the report uh, under section two, it, to the point of staff, you know, it pretty explicitly line, uh, outlines that the, uh, uh, that the city council would act as, a as the planning commission. Um, when we consider this, and I, I voted for it, I was under the impression that because the 90 something percent of this item touched on the business recovery program that the city council acting as a planning commission was in fact for the items that were touched on under the outlined business recovery program, um, which is exhibit A, which is the, uh, the things that are outlined in page five, which is again, the, the permits, the, um, the outdoor dining, all those things that I am fully in support of. Um, I, when I voted for this item, uh, at our last meeting, I and I even expressed concerns that if the intent was for uh, the planning commission's role to be temporarily abolished or permanently, that I was not in favor of that, and I wanted that to be brought back um, for consideration at a later point in time. Um, so I'm, I'm highly concerned about this because I, in my vote, I didn't intend to completely take on the planning commission's role going forward, um, and so. I, I think considering the gravity of this, of taking on this role and not really knowing the nexus behind wanting to take on the planning commission's uh, responsibilities, like I, I don't know why that would be needed. I haven't seen any reports from staff or anybody indicating that, that things are being slowed down in the planning commission to a point where we may be losing businesses in our city. Um, I just find the, the justification was a little nebulous um and so again I, I wanted to bring it up to my my colleagues i i am in favor in terms of item 14k in terms of assisting our businesses and in doing creative things like outdoor dining and and expediting the special permits and such um i think something like for this body to take on the role of the planning commission i think it takes more in-depth discussion and consideration than uh, simply being one section in an ordinance um, so those are my thoughts as we consider item 14K, gentlemen. I'm not sure if I'm the only one that feels this way, and if so, then uh, we'll go forward. But um, I'd, I'd love to hear any other thoughts. Um, Councilmember Hamada. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I would emphatically concur with what you said. Uh, what was discussed at the June 22nd meeting, in my mind, did not equate to a temporary dissolution, dissolution of the Planning Commission. Nowhere that in my mind that evening 
put that together, and, I'm, and I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, uh, I believe the 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 planning commission has value. Definitely, there's uh, some some excellent you know, experience uh, uh, with the members, um, and uh, their role should not just be cast aside for for a year. Uh, I think they can play a vital role in a number of items, and uh, we can discuss those later uh, under 12A. Uh, but, um, but that's my stance on it. Thank you, thank Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Hamada. Mayor Pro Tem Cook. I got to turn it off. The uh, when we first talked about it, I was under the impression, and erroneously so, that this was going to be a temporary, one year or less program, and I thought that could be useful in these uneasy times to try to arrange planning commission meetings or any meeting is really a difficult situation. And if we could expedite making sure things are getting taken care of in the way of planning by not having that layer of discussion, I was all for it. But I'm not of the mind that we needed to take all the responsibilities or many of the responsibilities away from the planning commission. I s think they serve a useful purpose, especially for useful input from the community because it gives another opportunity to hear from the public. And we've all sat on the Planning Commission. We know that those discussions go much deeper many times than they do in this chamber when we have a council meeting. And I don't in any way put that aside. Our citizens have a right to discuss as long as they want whatever meeting they want, and the Planning Commission gives them that opportunity. And so I would not say not to do this, but I don't want to do it forever. And we need to step back and take a look at it. We do need to take sure, make sure that we do have an opportunity for those that want to have outdoor dining are supported. We talked about whether or not we were going to rent the space the city owned or whether or not that would just be an exercise of futility. We talked about w what monies we had available to, to uh, help people get back on their feet. Those are immediate needs, and I we need to address that part of it now because time is of the essence. The other part we can certainly have more discussion about, but I'm not of the mind to uh, take away responsibilities of the Planning Commission totally and, and put it all on them. Thank you, Rotten, for your protein Coops. Uh, Council Member, something else. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, when I was reviewing the materials over the weekend, I was, uh, I was just flabbergasted into realizing what had happened. Uh, because in our discussion at the last meeting, my recollection was the city council will take, will take some of the responsibilities from the planning commission. And part two is, should we take some more, which was the second list. That was my impression. The first list was the outdoor dining, things like that. The second part is, should, should we consider taking away those, um, the other things that are uh, on the suggested list. And so when I was reading this, I, I didn't realize what had happened during that meeting in the resolution. So I, I don't know exactly what happened because I was more focused on the discussion than reading the actual resolution. So I, I am with you. I think we need to take a, uh, a slower approach because I don't want to take away all of it and then give back some. What I'd like to do is take away some and then maybe la later on take some more depending on what we need. But I don't want to make it appear that we're taking away all of it in one fell swoop and then give them back a little. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member something else. Council Member Dutton. I guess that's why there's second readings. <laughs> yeah. that's, it. that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Dutton. Uh, so I, um, and I know this isn't a, a public hearing, but I, I would, I would propose that we, uh, city attorney, is there a way of being able to segregate, like being able to approve certain elements of the, um, of the, uh, sorry, um, to be able to uh, approve the, the items that pertain to the elements within the business recovery program as outlined under exhibit A, which is the outdoor dining, 
the special permits, the expediting of that to be able to support our current businesses. Is there a possibility, uh, like a vehicle, of being able to approve that in our second reading tonight, but extract the other items with regarding the planning commission uh, roles and, and consider those, uh, you know, at, at, at a future point in time? Here's my suggestion, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, is uh, the council already adopted an urgency ordinance. So these rules are already in effect. The regular ordinance that is on for second reading tonight would have simply been the belt and suspenders approach that I always employ with regard to urgency ordinances. So what we'll do is for next meeting is we'll bring back an urgency ordinance that amends the original urgency ordinance to take out the planning agency functions. And we'll bring back a regular ordinance that also Im uh, implements the same exact uh, regulations. And for tonight, purposes of tonight, we will understand that the council wants to move forward with planning commission functions as originally intended. And we will just have the urgency ordinance be retroactive the next time around. In other words, retroactively amending the, I think it's the June, uh, no, it's the July, uh, what day is today? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the June 22nd uh, urgency ordinance. So I, I think it's, that's the easiest way to take care of it. And uh, I think that will, that will satisfy the, the council's intent. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Any other, Any other questions, questions or comments, or gentlemen, before we move forward? Okay. So I, um, so we need to make a motion and second, right, Mr. City Attorney, regarding what you propose? Actually, Mr. Mayor, just let this item go. There's no reason to have a second reading on this particular ordinance. Um, we'll just let it die, and then we'll take the the direction from the council, and as I described, bring back an urgency and regular ordinance for the next for the next meeting. Would you would you would you, would you would rather, you rather have a negative vote on that, Carl? You just want to let it die? No, just let it die. So, so I guess, I guess for for, uh, uh, for the record, since they were pulling item 14K, and that's it, correct? Both pulling item 14K and tabling. Item 12A. 12A. And then Carl, just to also clarify, by at the next meeting be, being retroactive, the planning commission duties are still per the BMC at this point in time? Correct. So, okay, thank you. So, so if, if I'm understanding correctly, again, just to be on the same page, we're pulling item 14K and we're tabling item 12A for tonight. Correct. Right. right. Okay, okay, great. Just to make sure we're on the same page. In terms of item 14Q now, which is a minutes for for the last meeting then. So let me pull that. So I'm pulling item 14Q now. So if you do, gentlemen want to pull that out. And again, that reflects the minutes from the last meeting. So Madam City Clerk, do we, are there any amendments needed to that item? I, I don't believe so okay. um, because the actions were taken mm -hmm. as they were taken. Okay. So there is no amendment to the minutes. However, this will be captured in the minutes of this meeting okay. and be reflected. Perfect. Great. So then uh, on item 14Q, then any necessity? So we'll just leave it in the consent calendar or since I pulled it, we have to take action on now. No? Okay. So we'll, we'll consider that afterwards. Okay. So item 14Q is, uh, K is pulled. Item 12A is tabled. Mm -hmm. Um, and before we move on to item uh, 13A, uh, I'd like to have a, a, a brief 10-minute uh, recess for uh, just a, a short break. Okay. And it's uh, item, it's 8.35 by my watch, and we're going to take a quick break. Thank you. Everybody thinks it's the mayor anyway. <laughs>
Okay, great. Uh, we are, is it, it is 8.41 p.m. We are back in session. Um, item 13A, Mr. Stewart. This consideration possible action adopt resolution number 20-35, uh, a resolution authorizing the city manager or designated to apply for, receive local government planning support gr grant program funds, local early action grant planning grants program or LEAP. And uh, Mr. Don Longo, who's making the staff report on this one? LEAP is not coming from my department, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, it's Rowena. Okay. Oh, okay. There you, there you go. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. Um, adopting the resolution before you will um, authorize the City Manager or his designee to continue with the application process of the Local Early Action Planning Grants Program, referred to as the LEAP. Um, the resolution before you is in response to HCD's Notice of Funding Availability, which was released in early uh, of this year, um, in January. Based on that notice, the city of Bellflower, which is considered a medium-sized jurisdiction, is eligible for a non-competitive grant in amount that ranges between $25,000 to $300,000 as a reimbursement for projects that accelerate housing production and facilitates implementation of the sixth cycle of a regional housing needs assessment. Staff has identified three projects that qualify for the LEAP grant, which are one, preparation of the planning document, including a zoning, including zoning ordinance text amendment following adoption of the um, housing element. Um, second project would be updating the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. And the third would be updating the city's geographic information system. In total, um, the grant amount being requested is uh, $300,000. Um, initially, the application was due July 1st. And due to the pandemic, the LEAP technical assistance team encouraged the applicants to submit application documents even if the resolution has not been adopted yet, which is what staff did, um, with the understanding, of course, that a resolution will be submitted at a later time. After um, the application was submitted, the city was notified that the deadline was extended to January 2021. So now we are way ahead of the game. Um, this concludes staff's presentation, unless there's any questions. Thank you for that report, staff. Um, questions from my colleagues. Uh, Council Member Dutton. Thank you, I got one. Rowena, does this grant application ask to have a resolution adopted? To have, to have the, the city manager, manager tell staff, staff to, to go, go for the grant? The grant? Yes, HCD requires a resolution uh -huh. to go with the grant application. Okay, okay. I just thought I just it was thought unusual because we usually see you know, in our stat bri weekly briefing, we were applying for this grant or that grant, and we've never had to have a re uh, resolution for it. Great, I'm a, I'll vote for, have you go for a grant, 300 grand. It's a good thing. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Council Member uh, Dutton. Council Member something else. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mrs. Concepcion, it's always nice to, s to hear you again. It's been a while since you made a presentation to this council. Welcome back. Anyway, I just have a couple of questions. Um, first, first one is, um, since this grant is non -com is non competitive, is there a required match? No, sir. No. No. Okay. okay. Good. Good. Now, the um, the staff report states that the funding is available from eligible for twenty five thousand to three hundred thousand dollars. So, what drives the amount? It's actually based on the population. Um, HCD defines Bellflower as a medium-sized jurisdiction. So um, we're entitled to $25,300,000, um, depending on what type of project um, we are bringing or requesting uh, funding for. Okay, okay, so, so go ahead. Oh, okay. oh, okay. So based on the three items that you included in your staff report, does this add up to about three hundred thousand dollars? Yes, sir. Okay, okay very, very good. good. And then uh, finally, the final question is: um, since the deadline was extended to January 31, twenty twenty one, will the cost that we incur for these three items, let's say if we incur it today or next week, will they be eligible for reimbursement? 
Yes, so um, the reimbursement is based off of um, the NOFA date, the notice of funding date. Okay. So even if we had completed some tasks that we're requesting funding for, as long as those tasks were, um, were initiated after the notice of funding um, release date, those would qualify for reimbursement. Okay, okay great. great. Thank you so much. Uh, let's look for more grants like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member uh, Santines. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Hamada. Yes, I concur. This is a great opportunity. Uh, and again, keep uh, keep going at them. Uh, um, you know, HCD is, keeps posting uh, money, money out there. So uh, hopefully we can qualify and, and get, for, you know, for once we, we get a shot at the max. So, so that's what's cool about it. All right, okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Hamada. Uh, my questions have been answered already as well. So, uh, Madam Deputy City Clerk, um, are there any members of the, of the public wishing to make comments regarding item 13A this evening? Yes, Mayor, I'll give the moment, the public just a moment, please. Mayor, I'm not seeing anyone wishing to present public comment. Thank you so Thank much, you so much Madam Deputy City Clerk. Uh, gentlemen? Uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd love to make a motion to adopt resolution number 20-35. Great. There's a motion, there's a second? Second. Uh, I have a motion by Council Member Hamada, a second by Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Roll call, please. Council Member Dutton? Aye. Council Member Hamada? Aye. Council Member Santanez? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Coops? Aye. Mayor Garza. Aye. Thank you so much, uh, Madam City Clerk. Item 13B, Mr. Stewart. This is a consideration of possible action to approve CRNR Incorporated's 2020 annual rate adjustment request for solid waste collection services. Mr. Enigmas is here to talk more trash. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Mr. Stewart. Again, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. In 2011, the city entered into a revised and restated solid waste franchise agreement with CRNR that established the initial maximum rates for solid waste collection services. The agreement allows CRNR to submit annual rate adjustment requests based on an approved methodology that includes indexes for fuel, labor, equipment, disposal, and transformation. CRNR did submit an annual request for the 2020 rate year. City staff reviewed CRNR's annual rate adjustment request and found it accurately implemented the rate adjustment methodology. The proposed rate adjustment will result in the following percentage changes to the service category. For carts, 3.7%, bin, 3.7%, roll-off box service, 2.4%, and roll-off box processing, 1.5%. Based on these percentage changes, the impact on the typical monthly charges will be as follows. For the residential card, it will be an increase from $19.64 to $20.37, representing an increase of $0.73 cents per month. And for the three-yard bin collected once per week, it would increase from $135.32 to $140.33, which represents an increase of five dollars and one cent. These tables illustrate a comparison between CRNR's proposed rates for Bellflower with those from the surrounding cities. For the single family residential cards, CRNR's proposed rates would be at about the median, and then the same would hold true for their proposed rates for the commercial three yard trash bins collected once per week. Moving on to the commercial three yard recycle bin collected once per week. Again, CRNR's proposed rates would be at about the median. For the organic waste collection, 65 gallon cart collected once per week, CRNR's proposed rates would continue to be the second lowest. And finally, for the organic waste recycling two yard bin, CRNR's proposed rates would continue to actually be the lowest. In regard to Prop 218, the rates that are being proposed by CRNR are at or below the rates as approved by the most recent two-year Prop 218 proceeding, which was held on August 26, 
2019. Therefore, a Proposition 218 proceeding is not required as part of the 2020 rate adjustment. Staff recommends that City Council approve CRNR Incorporated annual rate adjustment request for the 2020 rate year or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. Uh, Ms. Uh, Crystal Denning from CRNR is on the Zoom meeting in case there are questions. So with that, that concludes my presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Inez, for that report. Um, questions from my colleagues. Uh, Council Member Hamada. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it looks pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, I think staff has uh, confirmed everything that we would usually uh, uh, then try to confirm. So uh, it says here that the, uh, the Prop 218 proceeding, the, these rates are at or below the maximum rates. So, so. all right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member Hamada, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Uh, Council Member Santignes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have no question. It's very straightforward. And the, the bottom line here is they're following, they follow the methodology. And that's Correct. it. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Dutton. I'd like to make a motion to approve CRNR's <laughs> 2020 annual rate increase request because we've already beat that horse to death earlier. Second. So, you know, uh, before we uh, oh. vote, can we, do you mind if I just ask the oh. public for, but there's a motion and a second already, so it's good. Uh, we're being efficient. Um, Madam Deputy City Clerk, do we have any comments or questions from the public regarding item 13B? For just a moment. No problem. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Mayor, I'm not seeing anyone at this time. Great, great. Okay. Thank you Thank so you much. So I much. know, I know there's, there's a motion from, from Council Member Coops and, and second by Council Member something. I mean, sorry, Council Member Dutton, the second other, by Council Member something Ness. <laughs> My apologies, gentlemen. Roll call, please. Council Member Dutton. Aye. Council Member Hamada. Aye. Council Member Sansanes. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Aye. Mayor Garza. Aye. That's not good. I just got back from vacation. I shouldn't be making those mistakes. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, item. Number 14, consent calendar. Um, I already I pulled item 14K before. Uh, are there any items that any of you gentlemen wish to be pulled this evening? Yeah, I'm saying I'd like to pull item 14H. 14H. Just for discussion. For discussion? Yeah. Okay. No, no separate vote. Okay, great. And also uh, item 14M for just for a quick question. Quick question. Very quick question. Okay, so 14H and 14M. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other items, gentlemen? I got one, Mayor. Let me get my. No, no worries. Take your time. 14 something, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> that will be right. <laughs> I'd like to recuse myself from uh, 14I, doing I have a property within 500 feet of that location. Great. Thank you. Oh, they need a recuse us? Let's do it again. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 14-0, I will accuse myself because I have property within the 500 feet. And item 14-G, same story. I have property within 500 feet of the project, so I'll recuse myself from that as well. Thank you. So great. Uh, so let's take up item 14-H at this point in time. Absolutely. Uh, just. Uh, Mr. Stewart, in the staff report, you mentioned that uh, there'll be a full presentation in August. Do you know which meeting in August? Second meeting in August, Mr. Second meeting. Is. Okay, very good. Thank you. I know. That's what I said. Quick question. Okay, all right. Uh, item 14H. I've asked uh, Mr. Jim De La Longa to, to sh um, share with us some, some information about this item. Um, it's a good story that I think that uh, our resident should, uh, needs to hear. Uh, Mr. Delonga, can you uh, can you explain to us briefly what this uh, funding is all about? It's a loan, revolving loan program. 
Council Member Sente Inez, and good evening, Mayor and other Council Members. The revolving loan program was made possible via the uh, CARES Act through the EDA, the Economic Development Administration. And this is just one of those things that you can do with the CARES Act funding through the EDA. And it seems to be after our discussions with the EDA rep from Southern California that it would be one of the most competitive ways of uh, getting funding through the CARES Act through EDA and getting it out in the community as fast as possible. Um, what a revolving loan fund is, is a fund that is provided through a grant through the EDA that will provide us with a pool of funds that we could lend out to the business community to help uh, combat the, the impacts of mm -hmm. COVID-19. And in the future, these loan funds are paid back and we can re-loan them to the business community. And in the future, these would be more towards uh, business expansion, improvement, and new equipment for businesses that couldn't uh, otherwise get traditional funding or having trouble based on uh, maybe they're brand new and they don't have a business history and, and things like that. A lot of small businesses often have trouble getting conventional funding. So what we're proposing through this grant program is that we would uh, provide loans of up to $50,000. And this could be for businesses that need help from COVID to do improvements to uh, anything that they need to do to help uh, bring themselves back and, and address the COVID issues so that they can open and, and deal with that. The terms would be from three to seven years. It's typically a, a low interest rate. And in this case, it's prime plus two. Uh, loan fees are 1% of the loan amount. There's an application fee of $200. And then that application fee, if they are approved for the loan, would go towards the, the loan fees of the 1%. Uh, there would be a, a loan committee that would be formed, an administration board that would make recommendations to uh, approve or disapprove the loan and uh, keep our fingers crossed and we'll see if we can get it. We're going to try and get this thing uh, filled out and turned in by the end of the month. Uh, I think it's due on the 27th of July. Okay, okay. Th thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, so one, just one quick follow-up question. You mentioned that um, if the borrower, uh, when the borrower repays the loan, uh, we can reloan it again. Do you know uh, how long we can hold on to the money? This is almost a permanent uh, thing. Once you get a revolving loan fund from the Economic Development Ad Administration, it is pretty much an ongoing uh, fund that you just continue to reuse. And if you kind of run low on money and you don't have money to, to lend, you kind of wait till that pot builds up again and then you can start uh, lending again. So oh, wow. uh, we'll make every effort to uh, continue to um, service these loans and to advertise them as we did with the grant program to get people uh, knowledgeable and uh, interested in them. They, it does have a pretty vigorous underwriting criteria, but um, that's what we'll do. And I know you mentioned a match earlier uh, for one of the other grants. This does typically require a 20% mm -hmm. match. However, because it is through the CARES Act, the EDA is accepting requests to reduce or waive that match. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. Um, in fact, we'll try to forego any cash match and kind of replace that with in-kind staff time as our match for this uh, particular grant. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think this, uh, this loan program is very timely and uh, I wish and pray that, that we get it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for that, Council Member something this. That's a good, uh, a good informational item for all of us. So gentlemen, I know that 14K was pulled, um, 14G and O, Mr. Coops uh, disclosed a conflict, and 14I for Mr. Denton conflict as well. Um, considering all that, um, is there a motion to approve the action stipulated in the consent calendar? Second. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Coops and a second by Council Member Hamada. Roll call, please. Council Member Dutton? Aye. Council Member Hamada? Aye. Council Member Sante Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Coops? Aye. Mayor Garza? Aye. Thank you so much, and especially for item 14N with the Veterans Memorial. I think it's going to be really exciting. Uh, and item number 15, Council Reports. Council Member Dutton? I have nothing tonight to give. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Hamada. Uh, just briefly, um, 
just wanted to uh, say that the YMCA had started its 17th week of food distribution at the Belfort Unified School District uh, with our community. Uh, and uh, the effort has is nearing 200,000 meals served. So a big shout out to the YMCA and the Belfort Unified School District staff. Uh, on July 2nd, uh, I did attend the uh, Zoom meetings for SCAG, the Transportation Committee, and the Regional Council. Uh, some of the highlights, uh, again, uh, uh, they're still uh, uh, working on uh, uh, you know, clarifying the um, what the um, uh, uh, you know connect SoCal. Uh, so that's pl uh, that planning documents will be back for the region council in 60 days approximately. So uh, now uh, SCAG's taking the time to uh, try to confirm the impacts of COVID and. Uh, some of the results that are that uh, uh, come back uh, from surveys of, uh, of communities and stakeholders, uh, and some of the top noted impacts of COVID-19 to communities is the lack of income to pay rent, mortgage, and and also increased ve vehicle speeds on local roads. Um, the longer-term concern about COVID-19 impact to the community was lack of government funding for services and programs. So that, that was gonna be obvious. Uh, and then on the average, uh, let's see, 87% of, of, of respondents noted that the Connect SoCal goals were either the same or more significant in light of COVID-19. Um, also during the Region Council meeting, uh, they adopted a resolution committing to addressing equity and social justice in, in the agency's planning efforts. Uh, there was actually a split vote, uh, but uh, there was more uh, to support it, much more to support it. Um, also, uh, the committee um, um, adopted um, a partnership uh, with the California Community Foundation. Uh, so there's $1 million funding uh, for a call for collaboration, and that's to promote, that's a community um, given equitable economic and housing strategies throughout the Skag region. region. So, and as I mentioned on the fourth, I did go out with the sheriff and uh, had a bang up time. Uh, so it was uh, definitely uh, more, more so interesting than, uh, 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 but it was a wild time. So. It was like every, as I mentioned, every time uh, we had turned a corner, there was the opportunity to cite or definitely confiscate. So uh, it was uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, definitely opened eyes, <laughs> especially the ones who got caught, opened eyes. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, again, thank you to the Sheriff's Department staff for, uh, again, make, uh, putting out the effort and uh, and uh, I believe it was, you know, successful to the most part. But again, I think as was discussed earlier, that there's things to work on. All right. Ray, did you write anybody twice? We tried. I tried. I tried to point out that hey, hey, he's lighting it again. Yeah. <laughs> but we were already working on somebody at the po at the time. <laughs> so, yeah, there are apparently what I've been uh, learned some some you know, interviews with some others is that they only bring out a, a small portion. And they no, leave the, the good rest still behind hiding, the house. yeah. Right. And then yeah. they'll, you know, if they get caught, okay, there's only a few, and then they'll bring out rest. So uh, people tried to walk away from the from being cited, but uh, <laughs> you know, come back, uh, and everybody, you know. So, and there was only one potential dicey situation where it started off with just a few people gathered to dis discuss the citation. Then it turned to a dozen. Then it turned to probably thirty people, and they converged on the on the two sheriffs, and uh, it was pretty much wrapped up. The uh, the person accepted it, and uh, but the sergeant came in and says, "Whew, I think we got out of that one." <laughs> so I said, "Thank you." Because <laughs> all right, okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for that, Councilmember Hamada. Councilmember Santinez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just real quick, I visited the um, construction of the um, stormwater recapture project at Carrages Park. Thank you, Mr. Um, Bernie Iniguez, for giving me a, a, a brief tour. It, uh, 
I think it's progressing very well. Uh, I'm very, very pleased. I think they re resurfaced the parking lot already. They're installing the, um, the, um, the um, swings and then the water feature and then starting to work on the, uh, the yard. So it's, I think it's gonna be a very nice park when it's completed. So I look forward to it. So that's all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that, Councilman Santanez. Uh, you know, since we're at it, Mr. Iniguez, you do such a great job for our city. Thank you. And, um, you know, a lot of residents don't know that you represent us in different boards uh, of, of stature. And so for that, thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Joel, are you still on the line? Or have you gone, gone to, bed? to bed? I'm here to serve the public, sir. All right. <laughs> All right. I trust <laughs> you have your suit on. I have no comment. All right. All right. Question, uh, tell us a little about how our homeless shelter is progressing. Well, it's been a, as everybody should know, it's been a very interesting chapter, uh, a new chapter for Bellflower and an exciting one. Uh, right now we're sitting at about 31 individuals in the shelter. Uh, based on COVID, we have a little bit of a reduction in capacity. So we're going to be uh, working with that for a while uh, for everybody's well-being. Um, but it's been interesting to see um, the sheriffs going out with CityNet, who we've had on board for quite some time, and uh, working together to provide basically the residents, uh, the homeless residents, I'll say, of, of the city options. You can you know, you can go to the shelter, we have services, you know, directly available for you, or, um, you know, you can find other place to, to be in Bellflower that's, uh, doesn't have the same, you know, restrictions and legal restrictions that we have, or there's a, there's a facility in, in uh, Lakewood that you can be uh, taken to. So that's been very um, invigorating, I should say, to be able to provide, you know, clear choices, very clearly expressed and legally based and backed so um, we've had some meetings with the residents of the area. We have a committee, a standing committee of individuals from the city and from the local area where the shelter is. And uh, so far, I would say the comments from people living in the area have been that it's either the same or better than it was just some weeks ago before that uh, shelter opened. And we've got more, as you know, uh, councils approved more improvements to the area, to the park, and so better times are coming, we think, and then getting past COVID will always be a better time. Um, so we're pretty optimistic about how things have gone in the recent past and uh, as we expect in the near future. Thank you, Thank Joel. You, Joel. Do you Do you have, have any, any I've often asked those citizens if they notice fewer homeless on our streets. Do you have any response to that? Well, I've talked to a few uh, individuals and Others in my department have talked to a few individuals, and uh, the consensus has been either they they aren't aware because they don't notice them anymore, and I think, uh, Dan, you had indicated that sometimes when you don't see a problem, you don't even recognize that there used to be a problem, but in many cases, people are saying, I don't see the same number, at least in the visible public, visible right away, which is where the ordinance has influence, so I've been quite pleased with uh, the feedback I've gotten from people who have been paying attention in the past and are paying attention in the present. They've seen a difference. You're getting, You're getting good, good uh, response from our deputy sheriffs in the city as they work towards this. And the reason for that, you're right, is that they now have clear uh, choices that are supported, not just within their own department at a high level, but with a federal judge uh, who has been a you know, critical part of this, Judge Carter. So, so they're affirmed that they, because for the most part, law enforcement, you know, they're in, they sign up to be people of action. And uh, this is a good time for them to be involved with this topic because there's some tangible action that can now take place that in the past was, you know, murky, muddy, that sort of thing. You know, when, you know, we, when first we first began, began the, process the process with uh, Brad Fieldhouse, he offered the chance that calls for service would go down because the, the homeless are using so much of our resources. So I'm sure you're keeping track of how that's playing out as to whether or not we have more less calls for service having to do with our homeless population. Thank Actually, you. the sheriff's maintains those records. And what I wanted to do was to take a longer period of time to make sure we're not just reacting to 
you know, snapshots or it's too early to tell. I wanted to get a more longitudinal review of data before shelter and data after to make sure that it's valid, you know what I mean? So I don't have numbers as I sit here uh, without a suit on, but I plan to be able to track that, uh, you know, data as necessary. So, so six months maybe? How long do you think before you'd want to calculate, calculate something? Sure. Sure, we could do it tomorrow. I'm just saying. No, but, that no, but in terms, terms of, of have some, have real, some numbers real numbers that we, that we can associate. I would think a few months is definitely a clear, uh, a large enough data set, both pre and post, that uh, would show a trend and it would be a meaningful trend um, based on the new variable, which is the shelter and the new ordinance. All right. Thank you, Joel, for the update. It's an important part of our city, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, the public heard what's going on over on Cedar and Lakewood. All right, that'll be cool. Uh, I'd also like this opportunity to adjourn this meeting uh, for a good teacher friend of mine named Bob Forrester, Coach Bob Forrester. He died June 24th of this year. He's 88 years old. He was our coach back at Belfar High back in the 60s. He served there as our basketball coach and director of athletics for 17 years. And uh, then he moved on to Cerritos College where he coached the varsity, or the Cerritos basketball team. He was also there for 17 years. Recently, we had our 50th class reunion for the class of 1969. And we were lucky enough to have the coach and his wife, Sandy, attend, who he's been married to for 31 years. And it was just a real pleasure to be able to reconnect with coach and uh, share with him some of our experiences with him 50 years ago. Bob was the kind of guy that uh, at the time when you had him as your teacher, as your instructor, you appreciated him, but you appreciated him even more as time went along of all the values that he taught you and uh, all the things how he led by example. And uh, just a, a very astute man who knew how to communicate with kids, knew how to educate them, how to make them better and how to make them good citizens. And whenever we had our committee meetings to discuss who we might invite to come to our reunion, Mr. Forrester's name was always number one that was brought forward because we all thought so much of him. So to have him be able to attend our, our reunion back in October was really special because that was the last time any of us will ever see him. So I'd like to take this opportunity to adjourn our meeting tonight in memory of uh, Coach Robert Forrester. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mayor Pro Tem Coops. Um, on the shelter, I just really want a special thanks to um, our city manager, Stuart, and our assistance to the city manager, Ms. Stover, for really all their efforts with the shelter. You really did an amazing job with something that's pretty unprecedented for us. So a deep thank you for the success that our community is having because of those efforts and the people that were helping because of that. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I know that the governor today came out with some orders, uh, additional health um, orders. I, I know there's a, many of us that feel, have conflicting feelings regard them, regarding with them. Uh, I um, know that they, every time we get many of these orders, uh, while well intended, they do cause, I think, an expected amount of confusion to not only me, but I think us in our community as well, and especially to our businesses in terms of knowing what's allowed and what's not. Um, so I, I do thank you in advance for your patience. Um, if there's any questions that you have with that regard, I know that our, our website on the city uh, website has a substantial amount of, of updated information on that. So if there's any questions on that, please feel free to visit our website so you can, so you can get the latest on that, as well as reaching out to the county and looking at their website. Um, again, a, a vast amount of confusion in terms of what's allowed in LA County versus other counties. And so it's a, a times of COVID. Um, Today, I had a meeting, uh, a Zoom meeting with Metro. And uh, so I know we haven't heard about Metro in a while with regards to the West End and the branch. And so uh, I, uh, and I think I mentioned before that we're gonna be having like a, like a lull for a while because they were undergoing the EIL process and they still are. Uh, but what I, was, uh, what I was informed of today was regarding the upcoming, what they call Master Cooperative Agreements, which is essentially the agreement between Metro and the cities themselves. Uh, with regards to the actual project coming up. Uh, so those are gonna be coming up um, 
and I know that COVID has kind of set things back with that regard, but it does it hasn't stopped the process. But uh, they are coming up. Uh, we also talked about the great separation on Bellflower Boulevard and the fluid nature with that regard. I know that our staff is still having conversations with Metro staff with that regard. So uh, we, we're still having conversations. Um, the finality period is coming up though, but uh, we'll, we'll come to an accord here sooner or later. Well, let me just interject on that front yeah. so there's no confusion. We are having conversations, but the staff is basically telling us we have to take the matter up before the board of directors and the board's gonna have to rule on that uh, great separation yeah. thing. We've kind of punted it upstairs on that one. So we're going to gather our data, and we're going to make the request, and we're going to make the pitch to the board when the yeah. time is right. Kind of like uh, agree to disagree on this one item, <laughs> essentially, right? Um, and then the, uh, they're also uh, talking about uh, they're doing the last uh, preparatory pieces regarding what they call the first mile, last mile concept um, with regards to uh, how people get on the, uh, the rail and then when they get off and having accessibility. Um, and so... That's, they're making the final uh, tweaks on that. They're also doing the final tweaks with regards to the stations themselves. Um, unlike other rails where you had stations that are pretty distinct, they have their own kind of flavor and their own set of designs, uh, these stations are gonna be pretty similar. They're not gonna be exactly similar, but they're gonna be pretty similar. If there's any type of added enhancements that any city wants with it, with regards to their station, they're more than, uh, than happy to take our, c our funding. <laughs> And for us to contribute, if we had any, if, if we want any additional enhancements, but nonetheless, I think the um, the MO is going to be that they're all going to be pretty similar in, in look and feel. Uh, I think in September the board of Metro is going to be taking up the dreaded three percent contribution. Uh, uh, there's a mandate that that for this project that each municipality contribute three percent towards the project, and so I know that there's talk in terms of how that's going to happen. I think next month the board Metro board is going to be actually considering their budget. And that's going to be discussed we've, there as well. We've weighed in pretty hard and heavy on that one too, and how that's yeah. going to be done. So yeah, you know. so there's different ways of skinning that cat. I know that in the city of Inglewood, I think they actually were able to get credits for what they've done to be able to con be contributed towards that three percent um, credit. Uh, again and again, we'll cross that bridge. Uh, and then the EIR itself, it's looking like it's going to be coming out uh, early in 2022. I mean 2021. So again, it's going to be here. I'm like within the next five months, and I think that's why they're kind of tying these loose ends up here soon. Go ahead. I mean, I want to embellish the master cooperative agreement. Juan read that off. That is coming soon. It's a big document, and it's 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 quite a body of work for the city as well. So there's going to be a fair amount of things to talk about when that thing comes up. So uh, I expect to see it. Yeah, I think in the next 60 days we'll see that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Have yep. a study session then, huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's a huge document. It's really foundational. I got a question on the three percent. Yes, sir. Is it three percent of just the station, or if we're going to elevate it, the three percent is going to be more? <laughs> Did we pay for the elevation <laughs> part of this? All of the above. <laughs> I think it's all of the. It's going to be a big three percent. Yes. <laughs> well, and there's <laughs> that's a big discussion. I actually yeah. have a bad feeling there's going to be a lot of stuff swept under the rug on the three percent. One of the things that I've been really grumbling about in it is that is there are some cities on this line that we know can't make that payment. They're not going to. They're, and I'm really. <laughs> Don't want to offset those those costs, so I want the MTA to apply this thing equally across the board on the, the payment of this thing. And they understand that there's potentially issues there, but I do have a concern about the disequity of payment on that issue. But we'll Ab keep we'll keep talking about it. Absolutely. And, and again, these things are going to start happening in starting next month, and it's going to be a continuous flow of information on this project coming up. So I, that yeah. quiet period is about to be over. It's so time. It's time. It, the timing is exactly right. I'm glad you brought it up because I've been meaning to write about it for the last couple of weeks because we've had several conversations with MTA because it be, it's been slow, but it's going to ramp up very, very quickly, like you said. So yeah, yeah. very. What on the paintball park? Do they have any answer on that? <laughs> it's one of two locations they're considering right now. Yeah. So and uh, we'll wait and see. And they're being pretty coy about which is the favorite, but I think we know. So we'll see what happens on that. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and so the, the, the last thing I have with regards to Metro is that, uh, as you can imagine, with COVID and the effects of COVID and the revenue stream, we're affected. Every municipality is affected. Metro is affected as well by that. And so naturally, a lot of organizations and different projects are concerned about what's if they're going to happen or not, if what's going to get delayed, what's going to get um, uh, reduced. And I'm, I'm proud to know that because of the vast amount of collaboration that we've done with Metro, 
um, this project is one that is not being touched. That this project is moving forward. Um, I think there's a wide recognition that our region has been um, not invested in um, by Metro, and so I think there's a there's a lot of reasons why this one is moving forward. So again, it's coming up, and I'm really excited um, about it. So I'll continue to keep you posted. I know staff will as well. Um, I also had a meeting recently with um, Supervisor Barger from the county, and uh, we discussed. We're actually discussing Project Green Key with regards to my role as president of the league. By the way, my, my role as president of the league is done in three weeks, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's been already six, 16 months already. Yeah. So, um, and so I think by the time we have our next council meeting, I'll probably be done with that role. But um, I, I bring that up because dur one of the items that was brought up during that discussion was with regards to. Uh, and I think I mentioned before how um, we have Measure H, and I've been kind of sounding the alarm that every day that passes is one day closer to Measure H ending, that 10-year period. And I've been w advising people that we need to take advantage of Measure H and making sure that it's as effective as possible um, because I feel, my personal opinion, is that the electorate will not withstand doing another Measure H again considering the lack of success with regar that regard and and so one of the interesting items that came up during that discussion was the that uh, apparently there's some groups including United Way that are exploring I think the next iteration of that um, and how that looks and I, they brought up like 800 million dollars and so they're exploring where to get that funding and so um, one of the items that was brought up actually was the CARES Act funding for cities instead of coming to us being diverted and I said no but nope Considering the record of success, uh, respectfully, but at this point in time, uh, we as cities would not withstand that. So, just want to let you know the tenor of what's going on, the discussions going on. So, uh, I'll continue. Oh, we just kind of segued into other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Project Rookie was another discussion. And well, yeah. you know our feelings on that. <laughs> yes. No, I think we're I mean, we're good. We've done our part, right. and I think it was demonstrated Don't earlier. Forget. on. And so, and then uh, the last thing I have this evening is uh, I also want to uh, adjourn in memory of a of a close friend. Um, uh, I'd like to adjourn this evening's meeting in memory of Mr. Fahir Milian. Uh, again, a really good humanitarian, really in our community. Uh, he was born in November 4, 1942, and he passed away July 2nd of 2020 at the age of 77. Fahir was a co-founder and leader of Niños Latinos Unidos, Incorporated, a leading foster and adoption family agency here in Southern California. Here in Bellflower, um, as most of you know, they were located on Alondra right next to the Ness. Um, he was served as CEO and president of the board of directors for the past 30 years. His vision was to provide the best quality of care to every foster child and provide them with a sense of security so that they could accomplish the goals and inspirations. Um, in his efforts, that included uh, affecting positively the lives of over 7,000 children. And again, that happened here in our city and continues to happen here in our city. Fahira and his wife, Gurith Torres Milian, raised their family in the city of Downey for the past 40 years. Fahir will be remembered as a responsible son, a caring brother, a loving husband, and nurturing father, as well as a strong leader. Um, I personally remember him for every single time that uh, that we had the season coming up, the holiday season, and just seeing everything that he and his wife and their family and all the supporters, the foster families and the children being able to just enjoy the kind toys and gift bags that were provided to them. Um, it was just really amazing that, that spirit of giving that they had in that facility through him, and then they will continue to, I'm sure, um, with him in, in memory of him. Um, he is survived by his wife, Gurith, and their children, Beatrice and Lazaro. Our deepest sympathies and heartfelt condolences go out to the entire Milian family. Uh, so with that, a special note that the Bellflower City Council will be recessed on the fourth Monday in July pursuant to Bellflower Municipal, Co Municipal Code Section 2.04.020. So with that, uh, I'd like to adjourn Today's meeting in memory of Farhim Milian and Mr. Robert Bob Foster to the next regular meeting of the Bellflower City Council 
at 5.30 p.m. on Monday, August 10th, 2020. It is 9.26 by my watch, and this meeting is adjourned. I can't believe that's a year already that you served as the president of the league. <laughs> <laughs>